Welcome to the Great Loop Radio podcast, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. I'm Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. Today we're going to update you on AGLCA's advocacy efforts, and to do so, Karen Nettles from the Homeport crew will be joining me. But first, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes & Associates, Great Loop Yacht Sales, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. And with the business out of the way, I'd like to officially welcome Karen Nettles of the Homeport Crew back to the Great Loop Radio podcast. Karen, thanks for joining me today. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's always nice to have somebody here to have a conversation with instead of me just kind of babbling on about these topics. So where should we start as we talk about AGLCA's advocacy efforts? Well, we know that's an important and ongoing effort for AGLCA, and it's important not only for our members, for other voters as well. So why don't you tell us what AGLC advocates for on behalf of our members? Sure. And this has evolved over time because originally, you know, going back 10 or 15 years, AGLCA really uh, didn't dabble in the advocacy side very much. And that was largely because then and now politics is such a hot topic, and we really want to stay away from that. But over time, we really came to see that there were some threats to the waterways of the Great Loop, and we didn't have to be political to be protective of those waterways. So basically, you know, kind of our mission on advocacy is to work for unfettered access for our members to the waterways of the Great Loop so that they can continue to enjoy this amazing trip and this lifestyle. Well, like I said, it's certainly important. Can you give us some of the issues that we've worked on in the past? Uh, a, a lot of times it comes down to anchoring, and we will touch on that a little bit more uh, as we go through today, because we are going to focus a little bit on some happenings in Florida, which are largely anchoring related. Um, but we have been instrumental with our advocacy partners in the past when a law that was uh, kind of unfriendly for anchoring in Georgia was passed, and we were able to get that amended and a new law passed that allowed uh, more unfettered access to anchoring. Um, we have worked on and met with the powers that be at the Erie Canal to ensure that those waterways remain open to through navigation. Um, and we've been monitoring issues where there have been calls by environmental groups to close locks to try and prevent invasive species from migrating. That, of course, could close off the waterways and make the Great Loop impossible. So those are the types of things that we look at. Uh, we actually monitor legislation in all of the states along the Great Loop. And when we see a bill that could potentially impact our members, we start to monitor that and get involved. And uh, it's primarily a grassroots effort where the Homeport crew, in conjunction with members who volunteer to assist, can usually take care of most of the issues that we see come up. Okay. And speaking of issues, what is the biggest issues that you've seen this year? We are monitoring issues in a few states, but nothing that is um, that critical for the waterways of the Great Loop, with the exception of the state of Florida. And Florida has kind of been a bellwether state on these issues, which is why we monitor it carefully. Uh, Florida has the most miles of coastline, I believe, on the Great Loop, certainly one of the places that loopers spend the most time by the time they uh, cruise the entire panhandle and the entire peninsula of Florida. It is certainly a place where loopers are spending extended periods of time. So it's a place that we watch. Um, Florida is also the only state where we hire a lobbyist that we retain each year uh, that is paid for in part by our advocacy partners as well. And um, that is really just to protect the interests of cruisers in Florida, where in, in particular, anchoring has been under attack for quite some time. That continued this year, where initially a bill was filed to um, limit anchoring in a small area. That then got extended to uh, eliminating overnight anchoring within 200 yards of the shoreline of the city of Miami Beach. If you're an AGLCA member, we covered this pretty extensively in our Great Loop Link uh, e-magazine. But if you look at a map of Biscayne Bay, 
and look at the shoreline of Miami Beach, most of the water that is suitable for anchoring is within that 200 yards of Miami Beach shoreline. The rest of the bay is extremely shallow. So it really would have hampered the ability to anchor. And anchoring there is important, not just because it is a, a right of navigation, but because sometimes for weather or for safety or mechanical issues, you need to anchor for an extended period of time there. It's a good jumping off point for boats that are heading to the Bahamas or heading further south towards the Keys from Biscayne Bay. Um, and for slower boats, without access to that anchorage, they can be looking at cruising in the dark um, to be able to cross to the Bahamas from a, a safe anchor location. So that was the biggest issue for this year. Um, that's what we worked on. And, and I made several trips to Tallahassee, as did our advocacy partners, to comment um, and to testify at different both uh, House of Representatives and Senate hearings on this issue. So it's been a busy season in Florida. And we know that this is an ongoing thing in Florida, and it's been going on for quite some time. Can you give us a little background? Absolutely. So um, this issue in Florida really goes back to uh, going on 10 years now. Um, and there was a, a period of time, uh, 2016, I believe, where cruisers were not represented in Tallahassee. And legislation was passed that closed anchorages to overnight anchoring in three small areas of Biscayne Bay, three or four areas um, in South Florida, uh, between some of the Venetian islands, which are there in the bay. Overnight anchoring was eliminated in those areas. And that kind of set a precedent. So while cruisers were unrepresented, that change happened, closed a few anchorages. And for every year since then, our group has had to fight back against attempts to add more anchorages to that list where overnight anchoring is prohibited. It's been a year after year fight. It's been expensive and time consuming, and it's the primary reason that we retain a lobbyist year after year in Florida. We have been successful year after year in avoiding having more anchorages added to that list, but every year there are towns and counties who go to their legislative delegation and try to get their anchorages added to the places where you cannot anchor overnight. About two or three legislative sessions ago, uh, AGLCA and some of our advocacy partners and other stakeholders all came to the table and said, this is happening every year. There's got to be a better solution. And a compromise was reached that uh, was turned into a bill and went through the process and was uh, signed into law about two years ago that created anchoring limitation areas as the path forward for jurisdictions that wanted to have some additional teeth to get rid of the derelict vessels, the abandoned vessels, and the long-term stored vessels on the waterways. We agreed that those are issues. They're clogging up the viable anchorages. They are uh, potentially environmental threats. They are potentially eyesores. Um, and as responsible cruisers, we are also against those derelict and abandoned vessels. And what the towns and cities were looking for is really um, additional ways to rid the waterways of those problems. Responsible cruisers like loopers were just kind of getting caught up in that. So this compromise was reached, the anchoring limitation areas, as I said, um, and there are some parameters around those. A county can request an anchoring limitation area from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, those anchoring limitation areas must be less than 10% of the overall navigable waterways in the county. They cannot be more, I believe it's uh, than 100 acres in size. And if an anchoring limitation area is declared, then boats can anchor there for up to 45 days, and then they must move on. So it was a win for transiting cruisers like loopers, because they tend not to stay at anchor for 45 days. So it gives them plenty of time to wait out weather, to enjoy the waters before moving on. And it gave the, the cities and towns and the counties more teeth to help with the derelict vessel problem. So it was considered a win. Um, and then sadly, the very next year, another bill was back to try and close the waterways to, or certain areas of the waterways to overnight anchoring. That section of the state code had been grandfathered with the anchoring limitation area bill. Um, but yet there were still towns trying to crack that back open. So what we had hoped was the compromise to end the year after year battle uh, was not. And we were back there last year. Uh, and again, 
were successful in beating back a bill. Um, this year, it was another tough year, and the, the legislative session has since ended in Florida, so we kind of know the outcome for this year, and it was um, it was an interesting session. As I said, I got to attend and testify at a lot of the hearings, um, but unfortunately, it felt like for most of those, what we were trying to explain about loopers being responsible voters who are just as concerned about the safety and the preservation of the waterways as the land uh, waterfront landowners, um, it kind of fell on deaf ears. And a lot of the legislators took a little bit of a hands-off approach and said, well, if Miami Beach is saying they need this legislation, they must need it, so we're not going to stop it. Um, kind of a, you know, I won't legislate in their area if they don't legislate in mine. So legislators from other areas of the state were kind of unwilling to step in and and, and help with the issue for Miami Beach. So you kind of alluded to the outcome of this year's legislative session. Do you have anything else to add and you want to tell us what's next? Yeah. So so the end result, I mentioned that the bill you know, started off small, it then got expanded to include no anchoring within 200 yards of the Miami Beach shoreline, which really would have eliminated anchoring in a lot of the southern portion of Biscayne Bay. Um through the process and the negotiations that go on behind the scenes, the bill was amended again. And the result that passed both the Florida House and Senate was the closure of anchoring uh, between two more of the Venetian islands. If you look at those on a chart, uh, you know, they're not real viable anchorages anyway. Um, so this was not a huge loss. It was another compromise when boaters had felt like they had already compromised a lot <laughs> with the anchoring limitation areas. Um, so from that perspective, some of us found it a little bit distasteful, but it was a win in uh, terms of us kind of being the voice of reason and saying, okay, that is a reasonable ask. We will accept that. Um, we didn't really um, fight against nor in favor of that last change that scaled it back to just close two very small areas. Um, but as I said, that did pass the House and Senate. Uh, as of now, the governor has not yet signed it into law, but that is expected to happen as far as we know. Um, we don't see that the governor would have a problem with with the bill, and it's expected that he probably will sign it in the short term. Um, so the net result of this year's Florida session, legislative session, is that two more small areas uh, should probably be closed to uh, overnight anchoring in the short term when the governor signs the bill. So we're considering it a successful session, although we do not like the idea that we've lost a little bit more ground. These were not key places. It was not the hill we were going to die on, so to speak, uh, for those two particular anchorages. So um, that's where that stands. And, and you asked what happens next. Um, the governor's signature is probably next. And we've got some activity going on um, over the summer. And what our lobbyist suggests is that we meet in the, the, from now until the session starts again, which isn't until next spring, um, meet with some of the key legislators, um, help them understand that we really want to be part of the solution here. We agree with the problems that Miami Beach described, um, you know, things like boats that are long-term anchored, maybe discharging into the water. That's already illegal and, and certainly egregious. Um, there may be noise violations. There may be violations of business codes if people are running um, unlicensed or unregistered businesses from their boats. Um, the bottom line is everything through the course of this process that Miami Beach complained about is already illegal through other laws and regulations. So additional laws is not necessarily going to solve this problem. Um, it is primarily a problem of abandoned and derelict vessels. So we will continue to work over the summer um, we'll be looking for some of our members to bring with us who are constituents of some key legislators to attend meetings with us with those legislators to continue to work with them on this issue before a bill is filed for next year. And that can be the tricky part because um, Florida in general does not have as many residents in the summertime. A lot of people head north, um, but particularly loopers who are transient in nature are not in Florida in the summer. Um, so last summer we struggled to find uh, constituents who were members who were also constituents of the right legislators and happened to be in Florida during the legislative off season. So that's kind of our mission again. And um, just yesterday, in fact, two of our 
awesome members went with me to two different Florida representative offices to talk with them about this issue. And we had two highly successful meetings, I think. So I'm encouraged by the process um, and that by giving a little bit this year, uh, we are seen as kind of uh, willing to compromise, but uh, on top of the issue, so to speak, um, what we're kind of seeing, as I said, the voice of reason that we are willing to listen to the other side as well. And I think that has bought us some credibility and um, hopefully we can use that to do some meetings over the summer and carry us into next year. So why don't we take a quick break and play a message from a sponsor and then we'll come back and um, talk a little bit about, you know, where all of this stands as the legislative process has wrapped up. So we'll be back in a moment. Our friends at DocMate offer the world's most advanced, affordable, and safest wireless remote control system for your boat's engines, pods, thrusters, anchor, and horn. Once you activate the DocMate remote control with a simple push of a button, you are able to leave the helm where visibility is oftentimes limited, and then confidently and safely control your boat's movement from anywhere aboard. The result is less stress and a safer experience during typical docking maneuvers, particularly in tight marina slips and when navigating through locks, where potential damage might only be a matter of feet or just inches away. Learn more at DocMate.us. An alternative to the high cost of brokerage and the hassle and risks of buy-owner boat selling, YachtX.com makes selling your boat easy, safe, and produces better outcomes. Licensed and bonded, YachtX combines the comfort of professional advisors with the reach of multi-platform marketing and the convenience of web transaction management and escrow, so your experience is second to none. Best of all, with fees of just 1.5% or less, you save 85% or more in selling costs versus traditional brokerage. Ask them about their buyer representation rebates, YachtX Rewards referral program, and looper discounts. Voters come first at YachtX.com. We're back on the Great Loop Radio podcast today. Karen Nettles and I from the Homeport crew are chatting about AGLCA's advocacy efforts. So um, look, where did we leave off, Karen? Where should we where should we head next in the discussion? Well, you were kind of wrapping up the legislative session there in Florida, and you've made comments several times about Miami Beach. And we know that the, the bill that was passed was substantially scaled back, but we know that there's some ongoing issues there in Miami Beach. Did you want to elaborate on that any more about what's going on? Yeah, it's been a very interesting issue because, as I said, the, the, the bills, uh, you know, in total, the ones that would restrict anchoring this year were, were related to Miami Beach. And Miami Beach does have a problem in Biscayne Bay with some boats that are long term stored there. Um, that said, it, it's been a pretty contentious battle with some boaters who live there on their boats in Biscayne Bay. So it's still kind of being worked through the process. Um, there is a, a new commissioner in Miami Beach, a city commissioner, David Suarez, who has kind of been front and center on this. He is newly elected and, um, uh, you know, I, I've met with him. His constituents want those boats gone. Part of the problem is that there is that the boats really do have a right to be there. Uh, and the waterfront homeowners kind of need to understand that. It's kind of akin to buying a house by the airport and then complaining that there's boats or planes flying overhead. Uh, but it's a very delicate issue because there are people living there. Um, some of those boats may be in violation of, of rules um, and that, you know, remains to be seen or proven um, whether or not they're discharging into the water. Uh, there are very few boats that are equipped with the right equipment that they wouldn't have to pump out at some point. Um, and if the boats are there on the water long term, it does lead to some pretty valid questions about, you know, how they are handling their waste. But so with the, uh, let me back up a little bit. In Florida, the legislature has reserved the right to regulate anchoring at the state level. So the city of Miami Beach, that's why their legislative delegation had to file a bill at the state level. And that's why the city of Miami Beach can't make their own law to clear out anchorages. They're simply not allowed to do it. It is not their right to do so. Um, so when the bill got scaled back and the 200 yards within Miami Beach shoreline was no longer on the table, um, Miami Beach started to put some very onerous regulations around a dinghy dock that the boats at anchor there need to use to access land. Um, the city had closed a dinghy dock uh, kind of without notice and not sure whether they really had the legal authority to do that. Um, but a remaining dinghy dock 
um, they decided to attempt to put very stringent regulations on landing a dinghy there. And the regulations had to do with um, you needed a permit to land a dinghy. And the permit was extremely expensive. And to have the permit, you had to sign a contract um, that put a lot of parameters around landing the dinghy, but also around the mothership, which is a really interesting, you know, they're not quite regulating anchoring, but they kind of are through this back door of, well, a boat at anchor needs access to shore, so let's regulate access to shore. Um, and they were requiring a whole lot of pretty stringent regulations from the boat at anchor, including how far it had to be from Miami Beach shoreline. So essentially, they were closing off access to the dinghy dock unless your boat was anchored. And, and it was more than the 200 yards. I think it was 700 or 800 feet from Miami Beach shoreline. So, uh, you know, it was obviously viewed as kind of an end run around the regulating anchoring by trying to regulate access to the shoreline. Um, the city has since taken that bill off the table. Um, and as I said, it's been very contentious. There's been a lot of back and forth. There are a lot of different entities involved in this um, that, you know, the Florida Inland Navigation District has been wonderful on this issue. Um, they are an entity in Florida that gives grant money to towns for things like um, pump out boats and dinghy docks. Um, and they've kind of been instrumental in this and trying to uh, get Miami Beach to be a little bit more friendly to those who are out there at anchor. Um, uh, but it's just another entity. There's just lots of involvement. So I believe the current um, ordinance on the table with the city of Miami Beach is to not allow motored vessels at the dinghy dock. It would be human powered only. So paddling, essentially, um, rowboats, kayaks, stand up paddle boards, that type of thing. Um, I don't know where that will go. As I said, it, it keeps changing each each meeting. It seems to change. And it's been a very contentious issue there, I believe, have been lawsuits filed. Um, I believe there are more to come. Um, and I believe that group of of boaters in Miami Beach who live there in Bis Biscayne Bay um, are looking to uh, fundraise to to bring suit, um, essentially to hire representation to bring suit um, that they have the right to be there. That's not quite an AGLCA advocacy issue because it's not about keeping unfettered access to the waterway. It's not about eliminating anchoring for transients in the area. It's about you know, a long-term anchoring issue, but it is happening. And those boaters who are interested in that can, can get involved in what's happening there in Biscayne Bay, but it certainly is a, a tricky issue because it is not only a boating issue, it is a housing issue since there are people there who live aboard. So remains to be seen, but it'll certainly be one to watch. For sure. There's a lot of moving parts to not only Miami Beach, but advocacy in general. And as they say, it, it takes a village. So what other groups does AGLCA work with on advocacy? Yeah, it absolutely does take more than just AGLCA. So officially, our advocacy partners are uh, the um, Marine Trawler Owners Association, known as MTOA, Seven Seas Cruising Association, SSCA, and Defever Cruisers. So those four groups have worked together for a number of years now to retain our lobbyists. Um, that said, there are others. I mentioned the Florida Inland Navigation District, which is, is really advocating for uh, access to the waterways. Um, Waterway Guide is an AGLCA sponsor, but also has been publishing articles to make sure that boaters are aware of the situation. So um, Boat US, of course, has been involved, as has the National Marine Manufacturers Association. So um, it's a big issue and it's kind of being uh, looked at from all angles in Florida. It's super interesting because while the areas around Biscayne Bay in particular are currently not being seen as very friendly towards boaters, that's where NMMA holds the Miami Boat Show. Um, you know, it happens right there on one of the islands <laughs> right there. Um, so it's it's interesting to see Miami Beach be unfriendly towards boaters when boating brings so much revenue it's to the economy, city. Yeah. Um, and at this point, you know, while I said it's it's not so much about unfettered access to the waters, it, it's a challenge for loopers to visit the city of Miami Beach or the city of Miami because dockage is absolutely scarce. And if they're going to be hassled, if they try to anchor for a night or two and want to go in to shore by, by a dinghy dock and either have to pay a very large fee 
or um, it's like a 15 minute tie up. So you, you obviously can't go visit the city. So they're really closing boating tourism in Miami. And it's, it's kind of a shame to say, but at this point, I really can't recommend to loopers that that's a great stop for them. Yeah, that certainly sounds to be the case. And speaking of uh, voters, we know that people are listening, members and, and other voters that aren't members, you know, that may be interested in, you know, how can they help in the advocacy efforts, you know, not just in Florida, but, you know, anywhere boating and all, along the Great Loop. Yeah, well, the biggest thing, um, sadly, it, money. <laughs> money makes the world go round. And we, our biggest expense for advocacy is paying our lobbyist in Florida. Florida. Um, you know, in my opinion, our lobbyists have been extremely successful and are worth their weight in gold. But just having a high opinion of them does not get them paid. So we do fundraising every year. Um, you can go to greatloop.org slash advocacy and contribute to that fund. Um, anything that does not have to go to pay our lobbyist is then used for um, other issues that may come up if we need to get engaged elsewhere. Um, and anything that over and above what we need to pay our lobbyists this year or other expenses we have for advocacy would just give us a head start for next year's contract with our lobbyists. So um, that's one thing, and that's greatloop.org slash advocacy. The other thing is I mentioned that we're trying to schedule some meetings with key Florida legislatures, legislators um, over the summer months. Um, so if you get a call from myself or if you're a member of MTOA or SSCA or DeFever Cruisers and get a call from them, um, if you're in Florida uh, seeking your assistance with this, please try to answer that call. Please try to join us. Um, generally, these meetings are in the district office of these representatives and senators which means it's close to home for their constituents. We're not asking anybody to get to Tallahassee. And the meetings are short. These are busy people. Um, they can generally give us about 15 minutes, which is about all we need. Um, so with a short amount of travel time and a short meeting, it makes a world of difference to be able to bring a constituent to a legislator and say and have that person share their view along with us sharing our own. So those are the two things that can help. And we certainly appreciate all our members who have done one or both of those things already. And I'm sure there'll be people out there that'll want to help and contribute. And we want to thank those that have contributed in the past for sure. Absolutely. Um, we could not do it without the member contributions. Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. And unless you have any other uh, thing you want to highlight about advocacy. I think that'll cover it. But we, um, you know, this is certainly a, a tricky issue, particularly in Florida. So if there's any topic on your mind that we didn't cover, the uh, general kind of triage email address for AGLCA is info at greatloop.org. That arrives uh, primarily to Julie Shea, our member services coordinator, uh, and then she'll send it to Karen or to me or whoever can most quickly answer the question. So if you do have questions or ideas about this advocacy issue or other things for that matter, feel free to get in touch with us at info at greatloop.org. Um, and with that, I think that wraps it up for today. So Karen, thanks for joining me again. It's always a pleasure to have you here. It's glad to be here. And thanks to everyone who's watched or listened today. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Great Loop Radio podcast. Until then, safe cruising.